morning reflections this is the beginning of a day and you, I would like you to to contemplate when like when you get up in the morning what what do you feel like what is the mood what is the feeling of waking up and what is the mind like from the reflection watching rather than the forming a, an opinion about it how it should or shouldn't be just to notice rather than to react to it because coming out of sleep consciousness and having to, to say if it's cold or uh, is, we have to put effort into waking up to something don't we waking up always implies a certain amount of effort where just uh, going back to sleep pulling your blankets over your head going, it doesn't take effort it just takes a certain amount of effort I guess to pull the blankets up <laughs> But that's not not the effort I'm talking about. Because to get up, uh, uh, especially if, uh, if in the, from a passive state of sleep consciousness, where you don't where you don't have you don't feel fully awake or alive yet, <coughs> just notice what it's like. What does your mind tend to do in that state? Mm-hmm. I find that that uh, that because one tends to be in a passive state if you're not careful, one goes toward negativity, uh, kind of depressing thoughts or negativity. So morning chanting offers us a, a, a chance to say, do some, put effort into, into doing something early in the morning. Uh, an act of devotion. An act of devotion takes an effort, doesn't it? We have to, we we give ourselves to something. It's not it's not for ourselves. It's not like having breakfast or or having a cigarette or or doing something just for our own uh, convenience and comfort. But it's a, it's an act, it's a sacrifice, an offering, so that. Say dedication of offerings. We we offer the symbolic offerings are candles, incense, and flowers. Now these symbolic offerings, say in any Buddhist country, in Thailand or Sri Lanka, Burma, or even here in Britain, they, these are offerings that are easily obtainable. On the poor people wealthy people, whatever, can, in, in the poorest parts of Thailand, they manage to, to find flowers, candles and incense to offer at a shrine. And these are uh, symbolic, but also physically very beautiful offerings, aren't they? What is more beautiful to offer than flowers? It's a kind of perfect in color and form and fragrance. So flowers are the, the most perfect, most truly beautiful forms and creations on the planet. Incense is is something that uh, humans make, but it's out of the natural substances. It's offering something that, that is fragrant. And then candles themselves are for light, aren't we? We use candles, uh, say, before electricity, or candle light gives off a, a beautiful light. So that these offerings are they of a, for sight and for, for light and and color and form and fragrance. Sense you for or that which is truly uh, pleasant, beautiful in the sensory realm. They're also symbolic of 
uh, the flower being the, the the lotus. If you notice on the Buddha Rupa, this these are lotus petals. These are supposed to look like lotus petals, so that the the Buddha is generally portrayed as sitting on a lotus lotus throne or lotuses. Now the lotus in Buddhism is significant of moral purity because uh, if you've ever lived in uh, Southeast Asia everywhere there are lotus ponds and these lotus ponds can be in the grottiest slums of Bangkok and still a lotus blooming in a in a in a in a bog or a pond or a or a dump is always a pleasant sight, isn't it? The lotus never destroys or ruins anything; it only enhances. And it comes out of the out of the out of the muck and slime and dirt and filth. It comes its roots are in that. But it, it rises above all that to produce this beautiful flower and fragrance. So wherever it is, if it's in 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 a lovely garden or in a in a in a a, a horrid slum, the lotus never destroys or harms, corrupts. It only enhances. It gives joy to, to the eye when we see it. This is what a moral human being is in comparison. A moral human being is like a lotus. They never, they never harm, they never corrupt or destroy anything. They only enhance wherever they are. A moral human being in, in a beautiful garden or in a slum, in a palace or in a hovel is like the lotus. It's the, it's the, the beauty uh, of a human life that has taken on responsibility for itself. We come out of the muck and the slime like the lotuses, don't we? <laughs> and then we can rise up to that, that level above that. We're still, we're connected to it. We're not trying to, to, dis, to, to, to reject the the slime or the dirt but rise above it is the lotus even though its roots are in the in that it has its purity maintains its purity above that but not disconnected from it so take that as a symbol for reflection of of say offering flowers and of what is truly beautiful what is uh, and also symbolic of of the perfection of form and beauty that comes out of the coarse, hard earth uh, and, and rises above it into a very delicate and very fine, uh, beautiful form. Then the incense. This is symbolic of the samadhi or the burning away of the growth. As we as we develop our practice of samadhi, as we practice more and more, the kind of coarseness uh, and uh, of our lives, the, the defilement and all these things, as these burn away, they give off a, a fragrance like incense. So that you're you're turning the, this into something rather than than uh, say. Uh, trying to get rid of things and, and deny and suppress, you're using the way things are in a very skillful way. For example, to, to really develop samadhi or concentrated mind, you have to burn away the defilements, which means not to destroy them in an act of aversion, but allow them to wear away. Like if you just burn an incense stick in a bonfire, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have any fragrance, would it? You could, it would hardly notice it. But if you if you light it and let it burn slowly away, then we can enjoy the fragrance that comes from it. 
So we're not trying to destroy anything. We're not, it's not like suicide or jump, immolating ourselves in a in a fire. Then the candles, symbolic of wisdom, because there's sila samadhi panya sequence is the middle way of the of the Buddhist practice, so morality, concentration, and wisdom. Wisdom then is being able to see things clearly. A candle is something that's made out of uh, another earth's substance and we can and it can support a flame for a long period of time. So that the flame itself represents wisdom when we when we have a, a candle then we can see for a long period of time from the if it's dark, we, we have a flame to use. And it's not like a match where you, you can just kind of light it and hold it up and then it burns away very quickly. So you can't really get a very much of a perspective for a very long time. You just keep having to light matches and burn your fingers. When you have a good candle, then you can light the candle and it will hold the flame for a long period of time. The flame is contained it's not like wildfire. Like fire that isn't contained burns everything in sight and destroys and harms. But fire that is contained, limited, then is something that is brings light into our life where we can see clearly. So that is like with wisdom as we develop the samadhi or the, the ca- calming of the mind. We're not just being weighed down, overwhelmed by emotions anymore, but we're finding balance, emotional balance and calm. We can contemplate our own existence with wisdom, it's like the flame. But it's not like a uh, an inferno that burns you. It's a it's the continuous light of a flame that that helps us to see clearly the way things are. So these are offerings. We we offer these these substances, candles, incense, and flowers. An act of devotion, giving something, giving something to a shrine. And so these devoted devotion, uh, devotional uh, dedications to the Blessed One, uh, the Lord who fully attained perfect enlightenment. Now the the blessed one, or the, it of course means the Buddha. This is this can be an act of gratitude, because to our teachers, uh, those who have attained and who have shared their realization with others, we we have when we realize what a great gift that is to us, then we can only feel gratitude. We say the blessed one. And that's not the kind of just a, a, a belief in a God that is supposed to be blessed, but the feeling of, of blessedness or someone whose life has been a blessing to others. And when we co- contemplate the story of Gautama the Buddha, we realize that he, there is one human being who lived long time ago, in our terms of time, 2,530 years ago, in faraway India, who was enlightened and was able to establish a teaching in a, in, in a way that that teaching couldn't be um, given from one generation to another. Now, that's a very kind thing to do. <laughs> a, a wonderful thing to do, because we now are ben- still benefiting from one man's enlightenment. It's not like it, it was... It was. Uh, I mean, there probably have been many enlightened beings since, but very few can ever establish anything. Uh, maybe they're... They, they, they don't, like the Buddha was, was brilliant in establishing a teaching, 
and 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 the conventions that would carry on a teaching over a long period of time and so 2530 years in our terms of time in human values it's a long time isn't it there are not many institutions conventions that we have at this time that date back that we can trace back to somebody a human being who lived 2,530 years ago. And, here, and, and in India, some, to us, a country on the other side of the planet, who attained perfect enlightenment, seen perfectly, in other words, seen things clearly, perfect enlightenment. Sometimes we, think of, we can think of enlightenment as being kind of a blazing light that blinds us. You sit here hoping that su- suddenly this light will just kind of come to us and we'll be enlightened. It will be a blinding light. Totally kind of overwhelmed with light. Rather than perfect enlightenment, which is the light where we can see perfectly. If a light is too strong, we can't <coughs> see anymore. Kind of it blinds us. It's too much light. So we just squint our eyes and we can't see what's in the room, even though it's blazing light. But if it's, if it's perfect light, that means we can see without hurting our eyes, or squinting, or, or, or being deluded by it, or being frightened by it. So don't, don't say, see perfect enlightenment as, as, as like an like a atomic explosion. It's, 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 a, it's something much more gentle and practical than, than that. And that would just destroy us. But enlightenment allows us to, to, re, to, to uh, be liberated rather than destroyed. To the teaching which he expounded so well. Now the Buddha expounded a teaching a teaching is is not a doctrine of belief, but a teaching in which uh, this teaching is is for contemplation. It points to the way things are. It's not telling us how we should be, what we should believe in. If you notice, the Buddhist teachings are they're just saying now this uh, life is like this. Notice it. We're not supposed to believe and take this uh, and, and just quote the Buddha and say the Buddha said life is like this. But the the teaching is is encouraging us to look at the way things are. We begin to notice and and observe how things are. So the teaching, which is called Dhamma, is is uh, to be is is something that that we uh, are practicing here, we were practicing, we're using the teaching of the Buddha, the Dhamma, to look at the way things are for us, the way we're feeling and experiencing existence, what is happening to us, what, we're, what is impinging on us at this time, the way things are at this time. And to the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, as the Sangha, the Sangha is, is a symbol for, is, is, is a community, it's not an individual. The Bhikkhu Sangha, or the Samana Sangha, like all the, the sisters and the, and the Garikas and the and Venerable Chanda Paul and myself say, a Samana Sangha, or those who, who are committed to a certain convention. Uh, and it's symbolic. This is a, it's not to emphasize personal quality. Is it? You notice that everything is is more depersonalized. We're not trying to to uh, emphasize our idiosyncrasies or our special qualities in the sangha. But sangha also means those uh, anyone who practices the teaching, practice it well. So the, the sangha is is a refuge for us all. It's it's uh, for lay people as well as samanas. 
And that means to, to study and practice the teaching of the Buddha. That is the Sangha. Sangha, refuge in Sangha, allows us to, to look at our personality and our individuality and idiosyncrasy to see it for what it is. Because we're, we're recognizing that, I mean, Sangha is, is a Sangha of human beings, it's not a Sangha of, of celestial creatures or an abstraction. It's, it's me, it's you. It's like we are, it's men and it's women and it's young and old and all that. So it's, it's, not, it's not kind of etherealized or abstracted. But when, we're, when we take refuge in Sangha, then there's a sense of community, of one community, rather than a group of individual people doing their own thing. And we, we, as if we're all emphasizing our individuality, then we're all going to have problems with each other, because what I think and feel and how I react might be very conflicting to the way you think and feel and react. And we can just uh, contend with each other on the personal level and what I think is important and what you think is important and how I would do something and you don't agree, you do it another way. And we go on and on like that. That's not the, the, the disciples who are practicing well. Those are the, the ignorant human beings who are making a mess of everything. So, so in Sangha we 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 have a because we we're agreed to to in our respect for the Buddha and the practice of the teachings we can look at our own particular talents abilities views and opinions in a different way than if we are support at taking refuge in our personalities, in our views and opinions, then all we can ever feel in regard to each other is the feeling of being threatened or, or conflicting, unless you particularly agree with everything I want to do and the way I think. You know, I can pull, you know, try to dominate and, and tyrannize you and force you to bend you to my will, point a gun at your head. <laughs> but that's not practicing well, is it? <laughs> so in Sangha, there's a, a, the community uh, agrees, or like in, in say, in Hiramavati, the Sangha of monks and nuns, has some pretty strong characters in it. It's not, not like they're all just kind of wishy-washy type people that have no minds of their own. They've got very strong characters. And yet, it's a Sangha in harmony because uh, they're willing to, to let go of that, of their own kind of uh, tendencies for the welfare of the Sangha. Because we all agree to, in, in our refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, so to these, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, we render with offerings, our rightful homage. It is well for us, blessed one, that having attained liberation, you still had compassion for later generations. Deign to accept these simple offerings for our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us. And so this, this, is, this is the language of devotion. If you wonder, say, last night talking about language of rational thought and and uh, all that. This is this is the language of devotion. It's not like like the sense of of uh, that we believe in in some kind of abs of some kind of Buddha in outer space. But this is an offering from the heart. So we're speaking from the heart rather than from uh, a statistical factual position. Uh, when the heart is it has this of wanting to offer and and to to talk and to to talk to some to in in this way a uh, whole language of devotion and religious devotion is a different way of thinking than uh, does god really exist 
what did the Buddha say? It is well for us, blessed one. You still have compassion for you. You, you still had compassion. Deign to accept these simple offerings. Who are we talking to? Do we believe in the Buddha as some kind of celestial being or deity in outer space or what? Or is this just the way the heart talks in the devotional state? This is for your contemplation. Uh, on the rational level, I thought Buddhists didn't believe in those silly things. All, all you have to do is just see everything is impermanent and and you don't have to do all that. But on the level of feeling and myth and legend and love and compassion, this is this is how the heart relates to life, isn't it? They say, I love you and uh, I, I want to sacrifice myself to you. I want to give myself to you. Isn't it? Uh, doesn't make sense on the factual statistical level. Doesn't it? It's not. But it, on the emotional plane, it's what we all want to do, really, is sacrifice ourselves, give ourselves to, to that which is truly worthy uh, of, 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 of giving to. I and mean, who wants to spend their life, I don't think of anything more miserable than this living only for myself as a person. I think that is a hell realm. To me, that's a hell realm. To just see what I can get for myself out of this life and uh, and live only for my own comfort, convenience, and pleasure. I've done it, and it's awful, terrible, miserable way to have to be. Because I, I can't see anything in myself as a personality that I would want to, you know, that I would would find that 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 interesting or or wonderful to be with. And lock myself with with, with my personality in a, in a room, and without any way of contemplating it or getting beyond it, would be a hell realm. So in in religious devotion. There's always this this humility, which makes the self bearable, isn't it? When we're humble, then the selfish views and the and the and the the problems of personality and that are are acceptable because we're no longer uh, defending or or making a problem about self, but we're understanding what it is, and so religious devotion is always an act of humility, of sacrifice, of offering, of giving. And in this appearance of subject and object, isn't it, the way things appear on the sensory plane, as I was describing, as I was contemplating last night, that the sensory plane is has this appearance of subject and object, and we're always going to be the subject for this lifetime. Each one of us is the subject of our lifetime. Then making offerings, and, and we, when we when we do give and share and sacrifice, we it gives us happiness. At least I found this from from my own experience. Uh, that that life is uh, when when one is generous and gives to it, one feels happy about it, joyful. Where when one doesn't, when one is being stingy and mean and doesn't want to give anything, try to get everything, there's no joy in life. Now this is a this is what I've seen from my from my experiences of living that. Uh, just trying to get things for yourself, to me, is is uh, another kind of misery. It's because it's not possible to feel any joy then in life. And life without joy is depressing. And joy is the feeling that we have of giving. It's a, it's, it's, uh, there, there are different kinds of happinesses. 
the kind of happiness that is is generally uh, encouraged in modern capitalist commercial societies is the happiness you get uh, you have when you get what you want there's a moment of happiness there you, you want something want an, a new uh, car and then you you get it and there's a there's that feeling of happiness in getting something you like but I wouldn't call that joy I call that a kind of happiness in getting what you want and it doesn't last very long does it it doesn't it, when we get what we want they have a moment of happiness and then we start wanting something else and that's how the capitalist system has to maintain itself holding up things better like better looking cars new and improved products all the time that's the big thing isn't it it's new and improved last year's soap powder is no longer a, a happy moment for you <laughs> is it when you get the new improved soap powder you have a moment of happiness <laughs> when you wash your husband's shirt in this new and, and it becomes sparkling white and you can jump for joy like they do in the <laughs> television commercial <laughs> get the, the grimy stain out of his collar so that this this happiness is uh, from, from just trying to we have to keep wanting things don't we capitalist system is, is in advertising, always making us think that we want something new in order to be happy. You're, 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 no, you're, you're, you're worthless, you're no good if you're happy with you're still content with last year's model. Because the system depends very much on making you want things. Because, and then getting new things makes us happy. And then, but that happiness becomes increasingly less and less. Like when you, when I was a child, uh, and and I wanted things, and and then I, uh, and especially if I had to wait a long time and finally got them, I was happier for a longer time than when I can get things immediately. Now, uh, now the modern society is allows us to get what we want very quickly so that we we the moments of happiness become uh, uh, shorter so then we want something we keep the greed keeps going we keep wanting something and then getting it and then want so I, I know people who just spend days shopping day after day shopping Thai tourists come all the way from Bangkok to shop in Harrods and in, in, in London to get things to make them happy. And they're telling me that a lot of the things they're buying are, are things made in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the idea of going to, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's status also to go off and buy something in a foreign country then joy is and, and this Thai people have a lot of it in Thailand there's tremendous kind of generosity the idea of, of generosity is, is one of the priorities of their lives so uh, Thai people have a lot of, of joy in their lives because of they, they love to give and share. Now that, that's the feeling you get when, when you give something selflessly. You're not asking for any, anything in return. If you ask for something in return, you won't have any joy. In it. You just have some kind of, you've kind of stifled it because you think, well, I'm going to give you this but what I want back is uh, for you to say thank you and to and later on when I need something I expect you to come and help me 
Uh, and that, of course, will joy cannot come from that state of mind because this this kind of joy is is from giving because giving itself is that way. And any attempt to get anything back from it, even a thank you, is going to destroy, going to corrupt the joy. So that the idea is to give uh, without demand, without strings attached, without without asking for anything in return. And this is also a, a religious symbol, isn't it? Because in the holy life, eventually you find you're just giving without asking even for uh, you know, you're not you're not expecting any reward for it. You're not expecting to be saved or liberated or anything else. It's it's just worse. It's 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 something joyful in itself. It's its own reward. The sacrifice of oneself is a joyful thing. It's a joyful experience. It's its own reward. It's not because self-sacrifice is something one does in order to get something back. In itself is is its own reward. Mm. Then the the uh, the Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one. I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by, by him. I bow to the Dhamma. The blessed one's disciples who have practiced well. I bow to the Sangha. <coughs> The bowing is also an act of devotion. It's it's a, it's putting yourself in a in in a completely uh, vulnerable position. And your bowing is you're trusting completely in the moment because you're totally unprotected at that time. Right? Your your defenses aren't up anymore. In, you don't, you're, you're trusting that, that everything is all right, it's safe. And that the act of bowing also implies uh, that you're putting, like putting, bowing is putting your head down on, in, at the feet or at the base of a shrine. Something. And this is, this is a sign of humility because they Conceit and pride. We, we have this this view of, of holding our hand. I'm I, I'm I'm just as good as you are. I'm better than you are, and I don't bow to anyone. And and if you notice the kind of uh, haughtiness of that thought, the nose kind of goes up, and we we think I'm I'm just I I wouldn't bow to anyone. So bowing means we lower the head, and this is a physical action of bowing is 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 good uh, kind of psychologically for us because we're we're taking we're very much identified with our heads, aren't we? With our faces. This is what we we take pictures of, isn't it? We photograph and we paint portraits of faces. They don't paint portraits of feet. Mm -hmm. Feet might be in a portrait, but it's not the the, the emphasis is the portrait of somebody's feet. I've never seen it. <laughs> so our faces are very much what we think is ourself. You think of I think of any of you. I think of your face. If I go away from here, and I'll think, you know, it will be your face that will come up in my mind, not your feet. Now with me, it might be different, because I have very funny-looking feet. My feet have <laughs> are famous, so I think, <laughs> I think when somebody wants to do a portrait of me for future generations, I'll have them paint just my feet. That should be should be enough. Really. That's Ajahn Sumato, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so taking one's, what one identifies with most 
is one space, and putting it at the feet, putting it low, and, and, and making oneself vulnerable. This is an act of devotion. Of course, one can be conceited bow, or anything. I bow uh, better than you do, or, or I bow and you don't. <laughs> I mean, the, this, is, this is a corruption of bowing, because bowing isn't supposed, we're not supposed to put on a display or a show for everyone of how humble we, we really are. But it is, like all of these things, uh, 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 the attitude of mind combined with physical action is like offering of candles, incense, and flowers. These we're, we're putting together in graceful ways, in beautiful movements of the body, in, in acts of devotion. It, this enhances life. This the, the life of a human, of human existence is enhanced through these lovely acts, gracious acts, gracious gestures. Let's think of living in a society where nobody uh, is gracious. Everybody's just selfish. Nobody um, has any devotion. I think they're just thinking about what is efficient, and convenient, and what I want, what is comfortable, and 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 uh, so life can become very coarse and ugly and 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 uh, brutal that way. I've seen that in in uh, say living in America. Well, Americans are generous, yes, but they don't, they don't have, uh, and they, they're hospitable. But there's too much the sense of independence and self-sufficiency. So, so I was never actually trained in my, in my life to really look after somebody else. My, my upbringing was to look after myself, take care of yourself. I actually learned how to help others and take care of others in monastic life. Because in, in monastic life in Thailand, the, the emphasis is, is very much on service, helping others. And then the way of doing things graciously, sensitively, gracefully. This makes our life on this in, in the human society, human existence. It gives it refinement, and it makes it, uh, mu- it, it. It's a beautiful, makes our life much more beautiful, pleasant, calming. When we move in in gracious ways rather than in aggressive or clumsy ways, it's a different feeling, isn't it? Than if I should just charge in here like a bull and. And clump down on the on this seat here. I mean, y- you might get used to it, but it's not. It, it's, it can be very disruptive and upsetting, just because that's the way it is. It's not because you're neurotic and overly sensitive. It's just that those aggressive movements, actions, and clumsiness are disruptive movements. They're actually, and you're being sensitive beings, you're going to feel them. Where if you, where if one tries to to move in a way that is is careful and quiet, graceful, uh, unaggressive, then that it tends to calm us. There's a set feeling of of calm and and ease. There's nothing. Nobody's making a demand on us, or nobody is 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 uh, is causing, say putting forth that kind of action or movement or energy which disrupts. That's being considerate, isn't it? That's being uh, careful, caring, thoughtful of others, as well as developing, uh, and, and that also makes one's own mind more calm when we, when we try to move in, in, in graceful movements and silently and carefully. A society where people uh, help each other, respect each other, makes our hum- our human existence is always going to be is always going to be a certain amount of irritation and frustration in 
in the human realm. But we can make our lives uh, more uh, more peaceful and calm and pleasing. I mean, living with human beings can be, uh, you know, a real difficult endurance contest, or it can be a joy. But it's not up to, I can't just do it all myself. We all, say, help each other. We all begin to to try to to uh, to be sensitive and care about each other. Then that makes the society we're living in much more peaceful, calming, pleasing to us. I was spent four years in the American Navy. Military life is is really very kind of harsh. No sense of graciousness. <laughs> so they, if you move gracefully, they think something wrong with you. <laughs> if you speak politely, they they think they think something you know, you're really you can't you know you're just totally unacceptable in that society. You have to speak mainly. You don't have to have much of a vocabulary, <laughs> but the uh, but the emphasis and the harshness and the li- and the life tends to be one that isn't that it has a certain there's a certain goodness sometimes in military life that that, that that uh, men uh, in in those situations are oftentimes very uh, helpful to each other, but it's also also the the uh, sense of of masculinity emphasised the more brutal lower aspects of masculinity. In the sangha of, of monks, even. Even even if there aren't any nuns, that uh, or where they're just men, males, but who are training themselves as monks, the the standard is 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 much higher. There's a sense of of uh, much more refined concern and care and responsibility in the life of a Buddhist monk, and say in contrast to uh, life of a an American sailor. Now, with Pali chanting, this is people sometimes wonder why we we use a language that most people don't understand. But the chanting itself has its own effect. It's a beautiful language, Pali, uh, and it's uh, and when chanted, it's. It has a, tends to calm. It's, it's monotoned and rhythmic. And uh, if if just listened to as a sound in itself, most people find it calming to the mind, tranquilizing. Also, these Buddhist teachings have been kept within this Pali language, which is no longer a living language. So it's, it's, uh, it's like Latin or Greek, Sanskrit. But because of that, its meanings are quite... Uh, they, they don't change. They don't, they don't... Like so many English words now mean very much... have very different meanings than, they, than, they, than their original word. Because English is a living language. It changes very quickly grows and accumulates and takes in all other languages. But Pali hasn't done that, so it is, it is a, a kind of pure language in itself. It's also a language about the mind. So Pali has 
of very uh, makes uh, has very clear descriptions of mental states that oftentimes we wouldn't differentiate uh, and we wouldn't have separate terms for in English, which English tends to be a, a language that developed about looking outside at the way the world is, science, technology. So it's, I found the Pali language very helpful in, 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 uh, in reflecting and contemplating. Because it, it gives, to, to have another language to use helps us sometimes to look at our own English language in a different way. Begin to investigate more carefully, more try to, to understand our own language. But sometimes we can't really understand our own language that well till we study another language. So there are many reasons for maintaining and using the Pali for its rhythm, its beauty, its, uh, its uh, chanting ability, and its, its uh, skill as a, as a language that has concepts that help us to, under, to, to reflect on our own experience. However, sometimes some Pali scholars end, uh, endlessly trying to get the perfect definitions for words and they never actually look at their own mind. So they say, just like the word dukkha, suffering. Well, it's not really suffering. Dukkha is a, what is the perfect definition of dukkha? What is it? Well, I heard that in Sri Lanka, according to the Visuddhi Manga, and then, and the, but then in the Mahayana, Vajrayana, and, and so forth, and trying to get perfect equivalents for words rather than using words as uh, that you can that help you to look at the actual thing. I mean, what is dukkha? No, don't look for it in the dictionary, in the Pali dictionary. <laughs> Observe it. So in the morning now, just resolve today as a, make the resolution, make a conscious determination, in other words, that today is a day for being awake, alert, watching. If you're anticipating, worrying about anything, just begin to notice that rather than to suppress it or follow it. This is the, the second day, so, so now what I'm emphasizing in these first three days especially is just to calm down. Relax. Don't don't make don't don't. If you if you come here and then you you've got all kinds of maybe you're anticipating something or worried about something or fearing something and that will just make you tense. So that and it's important that it's coming from a busy active life to a more passive one. This is now is it's a time to just calm down. Relax and see that meditation now is just for that, for calming yourself, for relaxing, for moving towards peacefulness, serenity, for accepting life the way it is. 
if you're trying to get peaceful, then you're shouting at yourself, won't you? Be peaceful. Damn it. Or just be more, just try to be more peaceful with with the ranting uh, maniacs in your mind. Allow them to, don't, don't, uh, don't try to get rid of them, but don't believe them either. 